Chapter 21 of A Soldier's Letters to Charming Nellie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Latham. A Soldier's Letters to Charming Nellie by J.B. Polly. Chapter 21 A Thirty Day Furlough. Charlotte, North Carolina, April 23, 1864. Comfortably reclining within the ample depths of a cane bottom armchair before a cozy little fire, a mahogany table and writing materials within easy reach, a carpet under my feet, wearing neatly blacked shoes lately imported from England, and a stiffly starched calico shirt that cost, exclusive of the laundry bill, all of a ten dollar Confederate bill. Conscience clear, mind untroubled digestion excellent and full justice recently done to a first-rate dinner i feel myself every inch a gentleman over my head a neatly papered ceiling around me walls with bookcases filled with elegantly bound literature looking admonishingly down upon me from their rosewood frames the portraits of half a dozen ladies and gentlemen long since dead a couple of windows opening into the street through which I can catch glimpses of well-dressed people as they pass and repass, on business and pleasure intent, and a sweet, well-trained voice in an adjoining room singing to the accompaniment of a piano. Ever of thee I'm fondly dreaming. I have to pinch myself to be sure I am really the same fellow who, a month ago, wrote you from East Tennessee. Then, ragged, dirty, and unkempt, I sat on the ground, had no shelter but the blue sky, wrote on a board held in my lap, warmed by a fire that filled my eyes with smoke, looked only upon men as wretchedly garbed as me, and heard only their harsh voices, and the martial blare, clang, and beat of Collins' band. While encamped on Mossy Creek, down in East Tennessee, the members of the Texas Brigade were invited to enlist for an endurance of the war. In sober and unvarnished truth, it was enlist or be conscripted, and not the generous and considerate offer Henry V. made when, according to the well-thumbed volume of Shakespeare, which, in the absence of other literature, I have occasionally borrowed, and from which I have exerted the poetic gems with which I have ornamented my letters, he proclaimed, He which hath no stomach for this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made. Had it been, it is doubtful whether a single one of the furloughs, one to every tenth man, offered as rewards to those re-enlisting, would have found a taker. But under peculiar circumstances, the android mingling of moral suasion with an implied threat of compulsion, every mother's son of us stepped patriotically into the line and swore to serve our beloved country providence permitting for the balance of the war last as long as it may conscription you know is not a reputable method of earning the privilege of fighting for one's home and fireside then came the drawing of lots for the furloughs in which i was unlucky for of the two going to my company i drew neither but scheming and a modicum of filthy lucre accomplished what chance refused one of the fortunate comrades found all of his comfort, happiness, and delight in the fascinating game of poker, and in consideration of the wherewithal, to enable him to follow his bent, he readily transferred his right to a furlough to me. When after a long time the papers finally reached us, the important question of where to go arose, for I had no citizen friends east of the Mississippi, outside of the federal lines, except in Virginia, and judging from past experiences there, it was not likely I could find a place far enough away from the seat of war to be thoroughly pleasant. I remained in a quandary, but for a short while, for Alec Wilson, of Company D, proved himself a friend indeed by being a friend in need, and invited me to come with him to this place where he has numerous wealthy relatives. Thus it happens that today I am an honored guest in the house of Judge Wilson, an occupant for the time being of his library 
and an eager and charmed listener to the delicious vocal and instrumental music of his lovely daughter, whom to her face and to others I call Miss Annie. But in the gratitude of my heart for her unvarying sympathetic kindness, think of only as gentle Annie. To her humanizing influence, more than to aught self, I am indebted for the larger part of my self-respect and respectability. Accustomed all our lives to the simple usages and habits of western Texas people, Alec and I find it rather difficult to keep ourselves up to the full standard of these North Carolina gentlefolks. There are FFs of North Carolina, just as there are in Virginia. Determined to have all the fun and frolic possible to be enjoyed in our last thirty days leave of absence, and yet unwilling to cut entirely loose from the exclusive circles of the literary and polished people among whom the relationship of one and the good fortune of the other has thrown us, we lead double lives. One day, minding our P's and Q's, eating with our forks, punctiliously careful to observe all of the proprieties and requirements of the most refined and cultured society, in short, whether walking, dancing, talking, or silent, behaving ourselves absolutely and faultlessly on regal. The next day, consorting with plain, old-fashioned people, eating with our knives, unmindful of phraseology, romping, dancing, and flirting with the prettiest girls, and forgetful of prim, mirth-restraining etiquette as a couple of schoolboys. Ample opportunity for the doubleness is afforded, since two other members of the 4th Texas are here, and their folks, fortunately for us, belong to a great unwashed middle class of people who take life as they find it. Our indulgence of democratic proclivities meets with no direct rebuke so far as I am individually concerned. Hitherto wholly unknown, I am not likely hereafter to be specially remembered and grieved over as a lost sheep. But Alec, poor fellow, catches it on all sides from his half dozen or more handsome lady cousins, each of whom deems it her special duty and privilege to rake him over the coals for every one of his social transgressions. Where were you last night, Alec? One of them will suddenly inquire, looking at him meanwhile with a cousinly tenderness that forbids the least approach to deceit and drags the truth from him, no lens for lens. And then the sweet creature's pitch into him at a lively rate, and although pretending to make their remarks entirely confidential, give me the full benefit of them, in spite of the fact that, on hearing the first question, I make a point of engaging the judge in an argument from which I invariably emerge outrageously worsted. When my furlough came to me in East Tennessee, I looked forward to the many and great pleasures anticipated with a keen longing of one to whom for nearly three years social enjoyments have been almost wholly lacking, and the thirty days given seemed to stretch out interminably. Now, looking back at the twenty-odd already a part of the past, they seem only many short and fleeting hours. Only a mere taste of pleasure has come to me, just enough to teach me its flavor and to whet a sharp edge on an always craving and apparently insatiable appetite. Seven days are all that remain of the thirty, and within them I must compress fun and frolic enough to last until the end of the war, however distant and uncertain that may be. I will hardly have the luck to receive a parlor wound. The Yankees began shooting at my head, and will probably continue that pastime until, by some lucky mischance, they perforate that member of my body, and thus make it useless as a seat of thought." Counting up the days of my stay here, and making each give an account of itself, it is easy to calculate in what particulars I have been improvident or neglectful and failed to extract all of the pleasure possible from the best of opportunities in the most favorable surroundings. Retrospection, however, does little good. Time will not turn backward in its flight, do what I may in the way of praying and grieving. It is not here as in Texas, you know. There, you ladies find masculine game in such superabundance that you only have to choose which you will permit to fall into your traps and nets. Here, though, 
it is a case of one or two marriageable men a month and from fifty to a hundred pining maids and widows all the time the widows of course when they are young and pretty and not too largely encumbered with prattling responsibilities having much the advantage over their fair rivals i have no right to complain that either class has bestowed many alluring smiles on me whatever may have been my hopes and intentions at the outset of adding a spice of long wished for variety to life they were nipped in the bud by the treachery of my friend alec to make himself more entertaining to the maid he liked best he not only informed her that i correspond regularly with the texas girl but when cross-examined was mean enough to deny that i corresponded with any other this i suppose made the conclusion irresistible that i am engaged monopolized and appropriated beyond break or recovery at any rate while the girls listened kindly to my sentimentalities they refused to believe them serious enough to justify even a flirtation with me discussing the situation with alec he suggested i should let one of the darlings read your last letter and promised if i would to confess he was lying when he said i correspond with anybody but you that however would not do at all for that particular last letter was the first in which you have acted the part of a true friend at court and told me all that i have to hope and fear with respect to our mutual friend i wish you would send me a likeness of yourself there's no telling when i may get a final quietus and prior to such a distressing event i should like to look once at least at the face of the charming correspondent i have never seen in flesh besides i wish to show the picture to my friend lieutenant grizzle of company c to whom i have sometimes read portions of your letters he swears that he knows you are the prettiest girl in all texas and that if he survives the war he will lay his heart at your feet a week after he gets home i am sure the gallant captain in bragg's army who i suspect of having the first and choicest placed in your regard will not object either to my having the likeness or to my showing it to the lieutenant on the contrary he will likely be glad to have your thoughts drawn away from the stay-at-homes now infesting the texas coast and slyly but persistently seeking to poach on his preserves if he is like me it is the rival who remains always tangible to his sweetheart that he fears not the poor devil who is taking his chances at a front where fighting is the rule and not the exception no words at my command can express the comfort and company that the likeness of your mutual friend is to me i've had it so long looked at it so often and thought and dreamed so frequently of the lady it represents that it has become a part of myself an almost constant consciousness it has been with me in camp and on the march in every vigil on the picket post and in every skirmish and battle standing between me and every danger that threatened although not battle scarred it is war worn for it has heard the roar of artillery the rattle of musketry and the bursting of shells at eltham's landing seven pines gaines mill thoroughfare gap second manassas boonsboro gap fredericksburg suffolk gettysburg chickamauga raccoon mountain knoxville beans station and many minor engagements and skirmishes that will never find place on the pages of history of how many more it will be able to speak god only knows but unless we make better headway this year than we did last and unless the men in blue continue the poor marksmanship they have hitherto shown themselves the number will be doubled or even trebled should the time ever come as i pray it may and that very soon when its original shall fill its place i'm going to put it in a glass case place beneath it the list of battles in which it has participated in the marches it has made and set it where it may be a constant reminder of the past to me and my lady and such little folks 
as may develop an interest in their father's career as a soldier of the Confederacy. I have but three days longer to stay here, if I would escape punishment for overstaying the time set by my furlough. The parting from kind friends I have met sits more heavily on my mind because of the fact that I will have to begin soldiering again the moment I board the train. Counting up my supply of Confederate currency this morning, I discovered that I have not enough left to pay any hotel bills on my way back to the command. Considering that I left my blanket at camp, the sleeping out of doors I will have to do has not a promising look. I have nobody to blame but myself, though. I'd have been more economical. Speaking of economy reminds me of Bill Calhoun's last bon mot. When Hood was made a brigadier general, the Texas Brigade raised a large sum of money and investing it in the finest horse to be found in the state of Virginia, presented the animal to him. When he lost a leg at Chickamauga, the brigade raised more money and purchased for him the best artificial limb to be had in the South. When Bill was called upon for his might towards the last purchase, he fished it slowly and hesitatingly from the cavernous depths of his pocket, then removed a quid of tobacco from his mouth, drew a long, solemn breath, and remarked, I ain't got no stingy bone in my body, and you fellers all know it, but twined round every fiber and filament of my mental caliber is a never-dying spirit, a rigid and uncompromising economy. And I want yer to tell old Hood that hereafter he must slip a curb on the impetuosity of his bravery and stay further to the rear. Old as he is, he ought to know he can't do any good by getting closer enough to the blamed Yankees to be shot at. If he keeps on doing like he's been or done, it'll bust this old brigade here, buying horses and legs for old cuss. But I must close, not, though, because I want to, but only because Miss Annie is calling on me to come into the parlor and help her entertain a squad of maidens who have just called. End chapter 21. Recording by Dale Latham.